From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 66, recorded on May 19, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the Chase on Important Health Topics. Today, we're going to take a look at Paul's uh, column entitled, RFK Jr. Isn't Bothered by Measles. Oh, I guess he's vaccinated against it, right? Well, that's actually not the point of the column. Let's go over the evidence that uh, RFK Jr. isn't bothered by measles. First, shortly as you write, after he was concer confirmed, not concerned about anything, there was the first case of measles in Texas. How did he respond to that? He basically said no big deal. He said that, you know, measles outbreaks occur every year, nothing to see here, nothing new here. Incidentally, there have been four measles outbreaks this year. In this country last year, there were 16. So it's not unusual. We have measles outbreaks every year. Which really wasn't true. I mean, we had eliminated measles from this country by the year 2000. So the fact that it was coming back was worrisome and should have been, at the very least, embarrassing. And how should, how should, how did he respond to that besides saying, no big deal? Did he bring vaccines in? Did he do a public relations campaign for vaccination? You didn't really hear much from him, from him, which you should have heard, is you should have heard him stand up loudly and clearly saying, we need to vaccinate children in this outbreak area. It was in a Mennonite community that was under-vaccinated. By the time the first couple cases were reported, those were in hospitalized children. And if you talk to people on the ground, they, they thought that this was outbreak had probably started around November, December, not February when it was first announced, because they were seeing hospitalizations. Assume that, that most, that's just the tip of a bigger iceberg. That should have been alerting. And he should have very quickly made sure people were in the area doing proper surveillance and more importantly, making sure that the CDC had set up or helped set up and fund immunization clinics in areas at high risk. None of that was done. And then the, the outbreak, the measles outbreak spreads to other states. What should he have done at that point? So now it's in about 30 states and jurisdictions. And there are reported to be over a thousand cases, something like 1,100 cases. But if you talk to people on the ground, knowing that that those cases are confirmed cases, and meaning confirmed by often PCR or serology, and many people don't go to the doctor, especially in these, these sequestered communities, people have said it's at least 3,000 cases and probably 5,000 cases. So it's really the biggest outbreak we've had in 30 years. And um, it's preventable. We've had three deaths in, in this year alone for measles when the total number of deaths over the last 25 years was three deaths. And so this is very bad. And um, I think he just continues to downplay it by, at the very least, ignoring it. He doesn't really ever have a press conference, as he should, talking about what we're going to do about this. So he, during, these, during this outbreak, he said some very wrong things about MMR vaccine, right? Right. He was on um, Fox TV after, this is after two children had died, and said, you know, measles vaccine kills people every year. Measles vaccine causes blindness and deafness, both of which are wholly irresponsible and incorrect. Measles vaccine causes this exact same symptoms of measles. That's all wrong. Adverse events from the vaccine, it does cause deaths every year. It causes... It causes all the illnesses that measles itself cause encephalitis and blindness, etc. So what he's doing is he's discouraging people from getting the measles vaccine in the midst of a measles epidemic. I'm a freedom of choice person. Yeah. We should have transparency. We should have informed choice. And but if people don't want it, they shouldn't be the government shouldn't force them to do it. But these statements are clearly incorrect. Isn't there something we can do about a cabinet level appointee saying lies like this? In a better world, in a world dominated by logic and reason in which we don't currently live, that would have ended him as Secretary of Health and Human Services. To say something that is patently false, to scare people away from a vaccine that could save their lives in a better world would have ended his being Secretary of Health and Human Services. But um, I just think there are very few people who have any courage these days to stand up 
and 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 ask him to do that. Obviously, the Democrats are are saying that, but uh, people are scared to go up against a Donald Trump appointee, no matter how outrageous the statements. And in a better. U.S., I would say. Some countries in the world are okay. In a better U.S., he never would have been nominated. Right. As the outbreak has spread, he has also said that the U.S. should be proud that we have two deaths. Um, I, would, I would compare it to what's happening in Europe now. We've had 640 cases here. We've had 127,000 cases and 37 deaths. And so what we're doing right here in the United States is a model for the rest of the world. What is that about? That was actually his most outrageous statement to me and the most unconscionable when he said that, look at Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe has 127,000 cases and has 36 deaths. We are the envy of the world. Look, look how much better we're doing. We only have three deaths. And um, first of all, you don't need to compare yourself to Romania and Kazakhstan. They have hundreds of deaths every year from measles. Why don't you compare yourselves to Germany, France, uh, where we're doing much worse, or Canada or Mexico? It's it's just unconscionable, I think, that he would basically grandfather in those deaths, those two deaths in little girls, a six-year-old and an eight-year-old, previously healthy, well-nourished little girls who died unnecessarily. That should be a call to arms. It should make him... Uh, put all the resources he has to try, to try and stop this preventable outbreak. It is embarrassing at the least and tragic at worst. I mean, he may not be bothered by these two deaths, but there's someone's kid. No matter how many deaths, it's devastating for a parent to lose a child. And apparently he can't understand that. No, I think that we need to do a better job of dramatizing these cases, making them come to life. Because right now we sort of deal with statistics, right? We Numbers. There's 1,100 cases. And there's an, an old quote by Stalin, not that you should ever sort of go by anything Stalin says, but what he said was, um, one death is a tragedy and a million deaths is a statistic. And I think we need to make those tragedies come to life. There, there's really nothing more powerful than these parent advocacy groups. I just was giving a talk and the person who spoke before me was Alyssa Kanowitz from the Kanowitz Foundation. Her four-year-old died of influenza. And she tells that story in a way where no one sitting in that audience wasn't crying, uh, you know, because we all can identify with that and the tragedy of that. And that really needs to be the story we're telling rather than how many states and how many cases and what the doubling time is. We need to tell those stories, make them come alive, make this disease come alive in a very personal, emotional way. I think that would help, I think, Swathen. You also write that it's clear why he isn't bothered by the measles epidemic and makes a number of incredibly bad claims about measles. Can you tell us some of those? Right. So he, he says, for example, that the advantage of measles is it provides lifelong immunity. You will be pr protected for the rest of your life if you've been naturally infected. Not so with vaccination. With vaccination, immunity fades every year, such that adults are now largely susceptible to the disease. So you prefer to have measles. It used to be when, you, when I were kids, everybody got measles. And the measles gave you protect, lifetime protection against measles infection. The vaccine doesn't do that. The vaccine is effective for some people for life, but many people, it wanes. First of all, that's not true. Um, it's a long incubation period disease. Measles, you just need immunological memory cells like B cells and T cells, which are often lifelong. And we would never have been able to eliminate measles from this country unless immunity was long lived. I mean, think about it. If, if really all these adults were susceptible, knowing that measles is always walking into this country because there's millions of cases of measles every year and there's more than 100,000 deaths from measles every year, international travel is common. Think how easy it would have been to light the fire in this country for another measles outbreak if adults were largely susceptible. So that isn't true. Measles, measles, there's nothing good about having measles. Um, because you can get the same long-lived immunity by having a vac by getting a vaccine. The other thing he said that is just outrageous is he said that measles, natural measles infection, prevents cancer, prevents ectop uh, autoimmune diseases, prevents heart disease. Also, wholly wrong. In fact, measles causes an immune amnesia for years, um, so that you are more susceptible 
to other diseases after measles. I mean, this was true with, um, especially with bacterial sepsis, that you have an increased risk of bacterial sepsis because of a, a, a subduing of your immune system um, associated with measles. So it's the opposite is true. And we have the current pertussis outbreak, whooping cough. Has he done anything about that, Paul? He never talks about infectious diseases. As he said on, during his run for the presidency, I am going to give infectious diseases a break for eight years. And so he doesn't talk about them. He ignores them. I think they're largely, he believes that they're a good thing because you get immunity. So that's all good. The pertussis outbreak this year has a, a, a doubling time that's about twice that of last year. Um, we have fourfold more cases this year than last year. And last year we had sixfold more cases than the previous year. There are a handful of states that are experiencing pertussis or whooping cough deaths that hadn't experienced pertussis deaths in years, including two in Louisiana, two kids and ch children in Louisiana um, that died. And this is, was Senator William Cassidy's home state. You would have thought that would have been more jarring. And it's just um, hard to watch everybody stand back and watch this. So, yeah, sure, we're in the midst not only of a measles epidemic, but a pertussis epidemic and flu, too. We have 216 pediatric deaths from flu this year. Um, that is unmatched by anything since the 2009 swine flu epidemic, which had about 260 or so deaths. But it's because of under-vaccination. Every one of these these cases can be explained by under-vaccination. Is it possible that state health departments could step in and encourage vaccination? And they try. The problem is they have limited funds. I think probably mm -hmm. the best example is what happened in Texas. Uh, Dallas uh, had set up to to start uh, to launch 21 clinics in areas at high risk, meaning areas where immunization rates were low. And then they lost the funding because CDC is getting its funding cut. Seems to me that if this continues, that states are going to have to raise money for this because uh, otherwise we're going to have huge outbreaks. It's already happening. And I think you're right. It's all, it's just been put up to the states. And this is an, this is it's a. You know, the, these viruses or bacteria don't recognize state borders. This is a national tragedy. It should be handled as a national tragedy. So speaking of Senator Cassidy, last Wednesday he held a hearing and RFK Jr. was there. What Do we learn anything from that, Paul? Nothing we hadn't already known. I, I mean, I think that the, there was a sort of two seminal moments during that meeting. One is when RFK Jr. was asked by a Democratic senator, so um, would you vaccinate your son? against measles, assuming he'd never been vaccinated. Would you vaccinate your son against measles now? And he hesitated. Couldn't answer the question. He hemmed and hawed. If you had a child today, would you vaccinate that child for measles? For measles? Um, probably for measles. I, I, you know, what I would say is my opinions about vaccines are irrelevant. And then he um, was pressed, would you vaccinate your child against polio? No basically. Would you vaccinate your child against chickenpox? He said, well, Europe doesn't vaccinate their children against chickenpox, which isn't exactly true. England has a vaccination program now for, for chickenpox. But um, the fact of the matter is chickenpox, before there was a chickenpox vaccine in 1995, every year in this country, we caused about 10,000 people, mostly children, to be hospitalized with chickenpox pneumonia or with necrotizing fasciitis associated with the disruption of the uh, integrity of the skin that allowed for bacteria like group A beta hemolytic strep, which is the so-called flesh-eating bacteria to cause severe disease, or varicella, chickenpox, encephalitis. And, and we dramatically reduced those numbers. So why would you ever not want to give your child a chickenpox vaccine or a polio vaccine, knowing that there is that polio is, is, is out there? It's, it's, you know, we learned this from the 2022 Rockland County case, that the, the, those strains, those, those revertant strains are out there. And to lower immunization rates enough, and we'll see more polio. So it's he's the Secretary of Health and Human Services and could not answer what I think anybody would consider to be a home run pitch for that position. Would you vaccinate your children against these diseases that everyone else is being asked to vaccinate their children against? And he hesitated and couldn't answer the question. I suspect they have been vaccinated, but we just are not going to know, right? They have been. He has said that. If, if, uh, if, if I had my wish, he said, I would pay any amount of money. This is his quote. I would pay any amount of money to go back in time and not vaccinate my children, implying they had been vaccinated. Did, did anything else struck, strike you at this hearing? There was one other thing. When they kept pressing him about 
essentially asking him to give advice to people about whether to give or not to give vaccines. He just basically sort of threw his hands up and said, you shouldn't get your medical advice from me. But I don't think people should be taking advice, medical advice right. from me. You shouldn't get your medical advice from me, probably the, the, the number one medical advisor in this country as Secretary of Health and Human Services. And and I only wish he believed that because he's been giving medical advice, bad medical advice for the last 20 years. I mean, it was he who said, you know, vitamin A is a miracle cure. You know, and when he spoke in front of a, a Mennonite community in July of 2021, he said that chicken pox and vitamin A cure measles. He's, this is a very susceptible population. It's a sequester population. They see him as, as this is before he was Secretary of Health and Human Services, but they see him as, as a famous name. He gives advice all the time. I only wish he took his advice not to give advice, because I think that's probably one thing he said that I completely agree with. Hmm. And let's just point out that he is not a medical doctor, right? Right. He's a lawyer. So. And he does not have a PhD in science either. No. He doesn't. So what's going to happen as a consequence of this hearing? Nothing. He'll continue to do what he's doing. And, and we'll see whether or not we can get to a point where um, these infectious diseases he's largely ignoring um, are become so bad that people stand up. Because I mean, you've said this before, and you're right. Most people want to be vaccinated. Most people value vaccines. Most people trust their doctors. Most people trust scientists. I just think we've sort of gone off track here and we're paying a price. And I, I fear we're going to continue to pay a price. I mean, watch what happens with measles. Measles is the one that worries me the most because it is far and away the most contagious infection. And um, I think what will probably happen is by late spring, it will die down because that typically is true. I, we'll see whether that's true now, but it typically was true, but it'll be back next year. And, and if People are continuing to have this point of view. And if you look at Texas, for example, right now, there are more and more bills to make uh, to, to make vaccine um, mandates less and less prevalent, to push back on vaccine mandates, only increasing the, the number of people who are going to be unvaccinated. I, I ran into a pediatrician um, the other day um, on the playground because my grandchildren were visiting, and she said it's never been worse. Um, there's always been an anti-vaccine sentiment, but people feel really emboldened now to be anti-vaccine because the Secretary of Health and Human Services is an anti-vaccine activist. Well, you know, Paul, if, if measles goes away and the pertussis outbreak subsides, I fear it will just give him ammunition. I don't want them to continue, but he will say, look, no big deal. They're not going away. I think the trend here is one of a distrust of um, vaccines, pushing back against vaccines. I think this is what happened post-COVID. I think people saw COVID, COVID mandates as, as onerous, as government overreach. And this is this is what's happened. We've leaned into this sort of libertarian left hook. And I think we're feeling the results of that punch. And it's it's a punch back against vaccines. Um, and we'll see. Uh, what what could happen is there could be parents who, who are uncomfortable about the fact that there are these measles outbreaks or pertussis outbreaks or that so many children are now dying of influenza, and they stand up. And see, that's why I referred earlier to somebody like Alyssa Kanowitz from the Alyssa Kanowitz Foundation. Her little girl died of influenza, and she is part of a foundation where many, many parents have lost a child to influenza, and they tell dramatic stories, and those are the stories that I really do think need to get out there, whether it's influenza or pertussis or measles. I think those stories need to get out there because there's no reason for children to suffer and be hospitalized and die when we have ways to prevent that. We'll put a link to this column in the show notes so you can read it. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent. 